Hello folks, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and today's hardware review, the Ludlum Model 12 and the Ludlum Model 44-2 scintillator. Alright, and you, as you all know with my uh, hardware reviews, these are my own personal reviews. They're not, you know, they have nothing to do with Ludlum itself or any of the other pieces of hardware I've ever reviewed. You also might notice that I only tend to review stuff that's pretty good, and the reason is that, is that I review the stuff that I buy. They don't give me these things. I buy them myself, and I don't usually buy stuff that's bad. So on the one side, yeah, I don't usually get pretty negative reviews, but on the other side, that's usually because I only show good stuff. So take that for whatever it's worth. So let's review the Ludlum Model 12. Now, if you've seen the Ludlum Model 12 before, you probably think, hey, this looks a lot like a Ludlum Model 3 or even a Ludlum Model 2. And you'll see these on eBay sometimes, the 2s and the 3s. They're like the 12, but the 12 is a little different and has some additional components to it, which I'm going to go over in a few minutes. First, I'm going to go over the actual, uh, the actual clip that's on it, the handle. And the reason is because I'm going to pull this handle off and show you the actual uh, uh, gears and so on that are inside of it afterwards. So let's take this and show you basically the handle. Fits the scintillator, and you can also get a Geiger counter for this. And then I'm going to pull this handle off here and uh, show you the rest of it. So let me take the handle off. And by the way, this is a nice steel handle with big steel screws and everything like that. Don't you love steel? Heavy pieces of metal. Doesn't it feel better when it's a heavy piece of metal? So let me take these little screw things off and then we'll get right back to you. Okay, the handle's been removed. Easily done with a screwdriver. Thank you, screws and bolts. Let's move that out of the way. Now that clip, by the way, doesn't have to come on top of the handle, it can also be attached to the sides. Now this is the actual unit itself, by itself, and you notice it has little little clips on it for hooking a shoulder strap, which I also purchased and have, but I'm not going to share right this moment. <clears throat> Let's open up the unit and start talking about what it has. First off, the Model 12 has a thumb screw you can open up, and you can actually pull out the batteries. The batteries are nothing more than 2D batteries. <clears throat> and this compartment they go in is actually protected from the rest of the unit. So if you foolishly let the batteries leak, then you don't have to worry about them destroying your Ludlum, because of course that would be terrible. And we can easily put that back on again. Now, I'm going to pull this off, like that. And let me see if I can get this off. It has a pretty good seal on it there. There you go. <clears throat> And you can see here all the electrical innards. They're pretty well uh, secured. This is why it can take a little bit more shock than it looks like. There's a circuit board right here, wires connected to everything. Pretty small, easy to use parts. And there's nothing else inside of the case. And there's the speaker right there. So this is all metal, nice parts. There's digital components. This is the 21st century, of course. But um, still, this is a very, very nice unit and easy to get into as well if you're a do-it-yourself person, or if you just want to send it back to love them, they'll do it for you. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> now you may notice something right off the bat. This unit shares some uh, history with this unit right here. The old-fashioned uh, CDV700, like this guy right here. It's the same basic idea with the little straps on the sides. As you can see, the strap things in the sides here, and the, the, the dials, the uh, switches. They're very, 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 very similar units in a lot of ways. And this unit was built back in the 60s. This built, unit was built just a couple of weeks ago. And basically the idea is, if this is a really good working unit and does a great job, just upgrade it to the 21st century and use the same basic design. Because what worked back then works great now. And if you don't believe that, ask yourself when they invented that and how much it's changed. Now, let's go over the actual pieces that are connected to this, then I'll go over the probe that's connected to this. <clears throat> You'll see this has a um, six position switch for off, battery, and then th uh, four decades. And I'll explain what those do in just a moment. Those adjust the meter here. There's a reset switch, and high voltage switch, audio on and off and fast or slow acquisition of the, high, of the actual true reading. We'll connect a probe to this now so that we can see what this actually does. Now we're going to take this 44-2 scintillator probe. Scintillation probes like this have a crystal in the end of them. The crystal is right here in the end. It's about a one-inch crystal. 
It's a sodium iodide crystal, and it reacts when it hits, uh, when, it, when, when gamma rays or x-rays or other high-energy photons uh, interact with this actual device right here, they cause tiny little flashes in the crystal, and those flashes go down a photomultiplier tube, which builds up a small electrical pulse. And that, uh, the current that comes from that pulse, the, the amount of voltage that's in it, is directly proportionate to the amount of energy. I Meaning you could actually take this very same 44-2 scintillator and you could connect it to a gamma spectrometer and do gamma spectroscopy, with isotope identification. You could do that with this. In fact, I do do that with this. Not with this unit itself. This is just a scintillation counter. It just counts the pulses. But just for the record, this can actually be used in the field as a gamma, spectro uh, spec uh, well, gamma spectrometer detector. Now let's connect it. By default, it comes with a Ludlum C connector, which is a lot like a B and C connector, but it's a little bit different. It has kind of a housing around the outside of it. It's a little thicker, I think. And we're going to connect this right here, and we're going to move this out of the way. And now other connectors can be hooked up to this. Like, for example, here is a SC International RAP47 thin crystal detector. It's a uh, low energy detector. And with this little uh, adapter I have here, this will change the high voltage miniature high voltage connector on the end into a uh, model C connector that hooks up to this. So if we wanted to, we could actually hook this up to it, just like that. And if you had this unit calibrated to a energy dose or energy or dose reading, let's say it measured in grays or microsieverts per hour or something, then you would be re you'd be forced to do a complete recalibration if you switched uh, detectors. When you're dealing with purely just counts per minute or counts per second the way I deal, uh, you would not have to do that whatsoever. But you might have to open up these two screws here and change the calibration port settings to adjust the voltage depending on what the voltage is for your actual detector. These two use approximately the same voltage settings, so I can get away with just mixing and matching them. But that's, that's not the case with everything. But I do want to point out that this unit can be used with dozens of different types of probes. And if you count the fact that you can buy connectors to hook it up to other brands' probes as well, then I guess you probably could say hundreds of different types of probes could be used by this. Anything from proportional Geiger counter probes to regular Geiger counter probes to scintillation probes, neutron detector probes, you name it. Okay, <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's, let's turn this guy on. We'll switch this from the off position to the battery position. You'll notice that there's a little battery test. Let me move this up here so you can see the see it a little better. There's a thing here that says battery test. And that's a little tiny dial. And as we use electrical power, that will eventually slowly move towards the left as it runs out of power. Now, we have not moved since I bought this, and I've used this unit constantly, so apparently it has a pretty long battery life. I've, um, I've read 1,000 and I've read 2,000 hours as being the amount of battery life that this unit has. Either way, it's a pretty good amount since all you have to do is pop this open and stick two batteries in it to replace it. Very simple. At any point, um, not just on the battery test, but at any point in any of the dial settings, you can always hit this HV button. And then what will happen is from here to here on the, the lower end, you'll see in thousands of electron volts, you see it goes 0 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5. That equates to 0 to 500 to 1,000 volts to 1,500 to 2,000 to 2,500 volts positive. And this will tell you what the voltage is currently set to. So let's hit it and you'll see I'm right around 800 volts positive. This has an input sensitivity of uh, 1 to 100 millivolts, and it's currently set to 10, which is pretty much where you want to be for most scintillation counters. <clears throat> now, we're going to turn this on to the times 1000 mode, and then the times 100, then the times 10. We're starting to get something now, and now the times 1. The way this works is this multiplication factor is multiplied by the actual setting on the dial, and this tells you your actual reading. For example, right the second, because we're in times one, the meter reads zero to 100 counts, 200, 300, 400, 500 counts in one minute. And if we turn to times 10, we end up with, and let me hit the reset button, by the way, this zero is the meter and then it will build back up again, very useful. And times 10, we are at 0, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 counts per minute. On the times 
100 mode, let's reset it again. You don't have to reset it. I'm just resetting it to allow it to build up. You can let it go. It'll drop by itself over time. In the time of 100 mode, you have 0, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 counts per minute. And on the times 1,000 mode, you have 0, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, 400,000, 500,000 counts per minute. Now the background on a unit using a Geiger counter is going to be probably between 20 and 50 counts per minute. The background on using a probe like this, the scintillator, is going to be somewhere around 1800 counts per minute. And that's just because this unit's much more sensitive than a Geiger counter. We can cut the sound on and hear this. So let's switch down to times 10, which is where the actual meter is fine, because we put it at times 1, if you recall, it went completely hard over. So that means that however many counts per minute we're getting here, is in excess of 500 counts per minute. Switch to times 10, hit the reset button to get it back down again, and give it a second. Let's we'll see what our background is, and we're going to turn on our sound and look at this little guy some more. Slowly climbing. We can speed this up by switching from slow to fast. They have an S for slow and a little picture of a turtle, and an F for fast and a picture of a bunny rabbit, a hare if you like. <clears throat> the, the response mode works like this. In fast response, you get a quick response, but the needle kind of bounces around, and it's not very good when you're trying to get a very precise measurement, but if you want a quick response, that's the way to go. Switching to slow slows the needle down, and it takes a lot longer for it to build up to its uh, actual true reading, but it doesn't fluctuate as easily. It takes more inputs for the fluctuation to change, and so uh, the reading is more accurate but it depends what you're looking for. If I were out there, for example, hunting for uranium, I'd have this on fast mode. If I were sitting here in the lab testing something versus this, I would have it on slow mode. Let's cut the audio on. And you hear a clicking sound for every single gamma or x-ray that hits this detector. Not bad. All right, <clears throat> so the entire unit's pretty straightforward. Let's uh, go. Let's expose it to some actual radiation and see what we get. I should point out that when you get it, it comes with this nice manual. See, here's the manual. It has all these pages worth of information. Good grief, it shows technical schematics. If you're a do-it-yourself person, this is very, very useful. Most places don't provide this. All the parts detailed out. And if you look at this manual, and you look, for example, at all the little parts that are being listed and everything, this is going to remind you of the same manual that these guys came with. They had uh, blueprints in them. They had parts listed out like that. And one of the reasons is these, these CDV700 Geiger counters, the old ones, they may be old, but they were such a good run that the Ludlum apparently took a lot from them. They, they said, okay, these are great. They've been around since the 60s. People love them. Let's, let's use some of this. Now, Ludlum themselves has actually been around for a really long time, too. I should point out, by the way, that this has a check source in the side. A cesium-137 check source. I actually provided the check source out of my own inventory, uh, but the one I have in here came from Spectrum Techniques. You can buy them from Ludlum as well. And having a check source on the side is useful. Let me cut on the sound and show you why. Is the unit working? You can find out immediately. Set it to times 100. Reset it. Put it on fast mode. Now let's test against the actual uh, check source. And having this check source allows me to test my unit in the field. Let's say I dropped it and wanted to know if it was still working correctly. I could use that to find out. Hopefully I wouldn't drop it, but you know, things happen. They also sent me a manual for the actual probe. That's the scintillator right here. And they also sent me calibration information as well. This unit is freshly calibrated as you can see. Okay. All right, so now let's use this unit to, de to determine whether or not this is radioactive. To do this, we will switch to battery test and see what our battery is currently set to, make sure it works. We'll hit the high voltage button and make sure our high voltage is correct for our probe, which it is. Then we are going to switch to 1000. Always start at your highest and move your way down. That way, if you're in a very high radiation field, you will immediately see more quickly than you would if you were starting at the lowest and working your way up. I always suggest that you start off in fast as opposed to slow 
um, uh, mode because that way you can more quickly see exactly what your background environment is because you never know. You could turn this on and be in a high radiation environment. Now we're going to keep switching down until we see the needle move. It moved a little bit, but not much. Let's go to times 10. Okay, there we go. And our background's gone up a little bit. That should be a telltale sign. We're at 0, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. Now we're pretty close to the wire here. <clears throat> so let's test this thing with the sound on. And we immediately go hard over. That's no good. So let's set ourselves to times 100. Zero the meter out. Let it build up again. And now let's take this and test again with the sound on. And again, we go hard over and we haven't even taken the shield off yet. So let's set to times 100,000. Reset the, 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 the uh, needle. Get the probe. Turn to see what we get. We want to get accurate now, so we'll switch to slow. Looks like 340,000 counts per minute. Now, what is 340,000 counts per minute? Why is sodium-22, 37 kilobecquerels worth of it, too? All right. That, by the way, is a spectrum technique source. Okay. Now, if we want to actually test this source with a completely different probe, this is also pretty easy as well. We can take the unit, make sure the power is cut off, wait a few seconds, get ourselves a new probe, one that has either a C connector on it or an adapter for a C connector on it, make sure the, the unit's off, simply unhook the probe, connect it, and if we're not using an energy count per minute, like let's say, or not a count per minute, if we're not using an energy unit like a microsieverts per hour or miller Inkins per hour or something, if we're only using counts per minute or counts per second, or if that's the only unit we're going to look at on the monitor, we can use, we can actually switch this out without doing any recalibration. <clears throat> now we can t put this down, cut that sound back on, and then turn on the unit, switch it down to times one. What do we get? A new working unit with different characteristics. And as you can see, this one also is having a trouble with this potent source. Let's set it to times 1000 just for giggles and actually see what this thing's maximum is. Nowhere near as much as the other probe. But this is a low energy probe, so there you go. So, <clears throat> and all in all, in all my final uh, opinion of this probe and this uh, unit are as follows. The Love Model 12, I think, is absolutely top notch. I think this thing is built rugged. Um, I think that if I were stuck in a bomb shelter in the end of the world, which I don't expect is going to happen, I'd want one of these guys at my side. This thing is absolutely top notch. I honestly think that if I dropped this thing down a hill and it smashed to the bottom, it has a pretty good chance of still working afterwards. I have a feeling that when I am old and gray, this unit will still probably work. These will probably be found in somebody's basement 50 years in the future in the same way that these were and still be useful in that, at that point. I think it's worth the money. The Love the Model 12, by the way, is better than the Mo Model 3 because it has a greater and it has a customizable input sensitivity from 1 to 100 millivolts, whereas the, the Model 3 is fixed at, I believe, 30 to 40 millivolts, which is useful for these things, these scintillation detectors. If you're using a Geiger counter, you can get away with using a Model 3 just fine. The, uh, the actual decade switch goes from 1 times 1 to times 1,000. Whereas the Model 3 starts at 0 0.5 and then works its way up to 100. But at the same time, the, zero, the Model 3 can have a, um, a dial here that reads high enough to actually make up for that difference. So typically this is thought of as being one of the benefits to it. I don't think it actually is a benefit to the Model 12. I think the, inputs, uh, the, in, the selectable input sensitivity is probably the most important feature of the Model 12. That and the actual voltage range, which goes from 400 uh, volts 
to 2400 volts, which is much higher and much wider than the Model 3's uh, voltage settings. Basically, if you're going to use a Geiger counter, I would you buy a Model 3. And if you're going to be using a scintillation counter at any point, I would buy a Model 12. I think these are absolutely top of the line. <clears throat> I wouldn't even say that these are outside of the range of what somebody should get as a first Geiger counter. Now, most people don't want to drop the money on one of these for a first Geiger counter. They are not inexpensive. You could probably purchase two Inspector EXP Pluses or perhaps three regular Inspectors or three PRM 9000s for the price of one of these with the detector. But it all boils down to what kind of unit do you want and what do you want to do with it. So, so far of all my Geiger counters, this guy is my favorite by far. This isn't actually running as a Geiger counter, that's true, but it can be. This is actually a rate meter if you want to be technical, this unit right here. And so um, that's... That's my opinion. This is Tom from anti-proton.com and bye-bye. Um,